send 800,000 Hungarian Jews to their deaths. They put them in gas chambers and they suffocated them. They burned them alive. Suffocated gas chambers. They started taking poison gases and their intestines and their stomachs started bursting open. The Israeli Supreme Court virtually whitewashed Kastner's crimes because to admit them would have denied Israel the moral right to exist. So someone tell me, what's it all about? Summarize it for me. What do you have here? We look at the chairman of the Zionist organization in Hungary. Who was he? Rudolf Kastner. From 1943 to 1945. What happened in 1943 to 1945? What was it? Second World War. What happened in the Second World War? Holocaust. Heard of the Holocaust, they talk about the Holocaust, the killing of the Jews. Now this guy here, he's the head of the World Zionist Organization. He says, we'll strike a deal with Nazi Germany. You ensure that 800 of us, the leading Zionists in our community, we get safe passage to Israel. And we'll form Israel. Right-wingers. And then 800,000 Jews, these people who are non-Zionist Jews, you can kill them, take them. They're all yours. They're all yours for the taking. So in exchange for... Setting up Israel, they had the killing and the mass murder of the Jews, their own people. So this whole idea now that Zionism is pro-Jewish is wrong because it's not pro-Jewish. In fact, the, the formation and the basis for the creation of the state of Israel was formed on the basis of the deaths, which their own people let them go down. Now how much of this comes in the mainstream media? You don't see this. Even people who come and talk about Israel, they don't tell you the history. They don't tell you the historical background. That there was in fact collusion between Zionists and the Nazis in the Second World War. How many of us know one? He says here, David Ben-Gurion. But before we, before we come to that, this is one. David Ben-Gurion. Let me see if I can pick it, get his picture here. Uh, this man here. <gasps> Unfortunately, the picture is not. He was the first Prime Minister of Israel. This is what he says. In a letter to the Zionist executive, the first Prime Minister of Israel, in 1938, December 17, this is what he says. He says, the saving of Jewish lives, lives from Hitler, the saving, look what he says. The saving of Jewish lives from Hitler is considered here as a potential threat to Zionism unless they are brought to Palestine. When Zionism had to choose between the Jewish people and the Jewish state, it unhesitatingly preferred the latter. It preferred the concept of the Jewish state over and above the Jewish people. So the idea that the Jewish state was created for the Jewish people was not entirely correct. Because he said if it meant sacrificing Jewish people, we'll sacrifice, kill them all. But we must have our state, we must have our land. That's more important. Forget these people, let them die. Let them be killed, who cares? So that's the basis behind these people here. Now, this was one group. The land that these kind of people and the Rothschilds, the Rothschild family and the agents wish to occupy, were populated by the Arabs and they were populated by the Palestinians. But there was always only going to be one fate for them, these Palestinians. Yitzhak Rabin. Heard of Yitzhak Rabin? He was a guy who was assassinated in 19... 95. You remember that guy, Baruch, I think it was Baruch Goldstein, he killed him in 95. In the New York Times, writing in the 23rd of October 1979, this is what Yitzhak Rabin says. He says, we walked outside, in other words, walked in that land, like all your land you've got here in Bremer, this is all Israel. We walked outside, Ben Gurion, the first Prime Minister, accompanying us. Alon repeated the question, what is to be done with the Palestinian population? Ben Gurion waved, in, waved his hand in a gesture and he said, drive them out. Drive them out. In the 1917, 1918. Palestine was then what we call, we, we had it called, uh, it was Israel, it was Jordan, it was the West Bank, it was the Gaza Strip. All that was now Palestine, lands formerly belonging to the Ottoman Empire. And so they broke that up and when the terrorist, uh, 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 Zionist terrorism, people like these groups came, Close to a million Arabs, close to a million Palestinians were expelled and they were thrown out of their entire land in 1948 by people like Menashe Begin, by people like Yitzhak Shamir, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, David Ben-Gurion and so on. 
Um, an internet article which I picked up on the internet and um, something which is found here in respect of this particular group that you see here. One of the groups states that the motivation behind this, Stern, which was also a Jewish terrorist organization, they believed that the Jewish population should focus its efforts on fighting the British rather than supporting them in World War II, and that forceful methods were an effective means to achieve this goal. He differentiated between enemies of the Jewish people, example the British, and Jewish haters, example the Nazis, believing that the, that the British needed to be defeated and the Nazis just needed to be neutralized. Just look how they train them. They train young kids. Young children are being trained in the arts of warfare. Child soldiers. They're training child soldiers. They were responsible for what we call the King David bombing, where close to, uh, in 1946, the King David bombing in 1946, close to 91 Britons, Arabs and Jews, injuring many more, were slaughtered and put to their death. Assassinations as one of the uh, reasons for the creation of the State of Israel. In the World Socialist website we read further uh, regarding an article on Ariel Sharon, because Ariel Sharon was one of the individuals behind this. He says, it is not simply that Ariel Sharon and company are a bunch of hypocrites or political amnesiacs. More importantly, the Irgun, led by who? Menachem Begin, one of the Prime Ministers of Israel in 1979, 1980. He was a Prime Minister, he was responsible for the bombing in his own land. Menachem Begin, the Stern Group and Lehi successor went on to form the Herod Party, forerunner of the Liquid Party and the ultra-right-wing Moledet Party, which was the main coalition partners of Sharon's governments. The gang of former generals, ultra-nationalists and religious bigots that run Israel today are the political heirs of terrorists who furthermore had close connections with the fascists. In this, they mirrored some of the Arab nationalists in Palestine who allied themselves with Germany in order to rid themselves of British imperialism. So these are the kind of people behind, here's here, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin, birds of a feather, flock together. And these are some of the killings. This is what we see called the Deir Yassin Massacre. The Deir Yassin Massacre was something where people were beheaded, children were being beheaded, and their bodies and torsos were, it was a place called Deir Yassin. Um, You've know, got the facts here. David Ben Gurion was behind it, the first Prime Minister. Deir Yassin. They had people killed and they dumped their torsos in the river. They had children being beheaded. They exterminated them. The Deir Yassin massacre in 1941 at a place called Deir Yassin. Sorry, in the 19, after 1948, 1949. For the purpose of establishing the State of Israel, these massacres were necessary. So these were the kind of individuals who are behind what we see in the in the world today this was a kind of brief it's a brief background to what I have and this is basically the formation in terms of how the state of Israel was formed the Zionism being the forerunner to what we see in the world today um, and, and and you look for example at at the districts look at the look at the factors look at the population destruction of Arab districts in Jerusalem in before 1948 Number of villages were 33. Number of villages today in Jerusalem, 4. Number of destroyed villages, 29. In Bethlehem, before 1948, 7 villages. Number of villages today, 0. In Hebron, number of villages before 1948, 16. Number of villages today, 0. Jaffa, number of villages in... in, in the, in uh, Jaffa, in before 1948, 23, today zero. In fact, the total number of villages in all that particular area in Palestine before 1948 were 475. 475 villages. Today, the number of villages are close to just 90. What happened to all the rest? They were all exterminated. They were removed. They were eliminated. They were, and this is based on uh, a report by the. Based on Israel Shahak, it's a report by the League for Human and Civil Rights. Arab villages destroyed in Israel, coated in Davis and Mezvinsky, uh, 1975. So, 
the data that you've got here is even to a certain extent incomplete because in certain instances the compiler found it impossible to locate Arab tribes. How come? When do you find it impossible to locate Arab tribes? When? When there's been systematic genocide to the extent that there's no survivors. There's no survivors left. That's only when it becomes impossible to locate. You can't even look back at the history. The entire community has been destroyed. So that's a kind of brief background to the, to the state of Israel um, I, and, and its formation and particularly Zionist philosophy that's been included. I want to go on to another section. Like how did the African Arabs emerge? Because now when you trace back, it's like, didn't it the Jews, uh, I'm saying the, the, the African Jews, so to say. Because when you find that the Jews originally are from uh, the son of uh, Ibrahim, <coughs> which is Isa. And now I want to know how did like they, they no. When we say that we have Arab Jews and yeah. it's the same it's the same principle which you apply uh, to um, when I said that Jews are not a race. That's the main thing you need to understand. Jews are not a race. Which means that you don't have such thing called a Jewish race. There are people from different backgrounds and communities who are Jews. You'd have Chinese Jews, you'd have African Jews, you'd have Arab Jews, you'd have white Jews, you'd have European Jews. These Ethiopian Jews are sometimes what they call, um, um, there's a name for them, I can't recall them, but they are Jews that have been Jews for centuries. They converted to Judaism. Uh, when there was the Egyptian bondage and when people came to Egypt and parts of Africa and the Sudanese basin, that's when these people came into contact and they became Jews as long as that. These African Jews have been Jews from time immemorial. The Sephardic Jews are Jews who are part and parcel of Israel, who are living side to side with Arabs. They are Semitic. They are themselves uh, basically indigenous to that particular region. Arab Jews, people like in southern Yemen, they are Arabs by nature. Like for example, you've heard in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, when he had the alliances with the Jews, who were they? They were not European Jews, they were Arab Jews. They were Arabs, but they were Jewish people. They were not a Jewish race. The Banu Koreza or the Banu Kainukai, the uh, Banu Nadir, all these were Arab Jews, Arabs themselves. So it was not a different race. So coming to your question about African Jews, African Jews are part and parcel of the entire makeup of what we call Judaism today. But in so far, the point I was trying to illustrate, in so far as their status and their level and their access to health care and their access to uh, amenities are concerned in Israel, they are discriminated against considerably. They are at the lower lung of the radar. In fact, apartheid Israel, if you talk about apartheid Israel, here's a chair. I've got a quotation here that Israel's apartheid goes much deeper than that. Even the Jewish population is divided into levels of privilege decided by genetic origin. The white Ashkenazim, who are the white Ashkenazim? Those who come from the Khazar region, the Caucasus, European Jews, those who came from Poland and then settled. Germany, these are European Jews. The Ashkenazim, white Ashkenazim from Europe and America are by law at the top of the pyramid of privilege. Below them, in Israel's genetic caste system, is the Sephardic Jews or the Mizrahim, they call them the Eastern ones, who came from Arab countries and do have an historical connection to the Middle East, the Sephardic Jews. They are second below them. Sephardic people are descended from Jews who were expelled from Spain in 1492. You know, under they lived in peace with the Arabs for hundreds and thousands of years. In fact, uh, years before the Ashkenazi arrived in, in, the, in Israel. They are those people who, you remember when Spain was under Muslim rule, you had uh, Jewish people living in Spain, and then when they were kicked out, when, when they were kicked out by Queen, King, Queen Ferdinand and, uh, sorry, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, where did they go to? They went to Arab lands, and the Arabs invited them, Ahlan or Sahlan. And they lived there with Arabs side by side. Their descendants are the Sephardic Jews. They are below the level. Then in the bottom, you find, for example, what we call the Yemeni Jews. They face extraordinary discrimination. Uh, um, and, 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 and what had happened was that their children were given to adoption to the Ashkenazi. You know, like the stolen generation in Australia, the Aborigines. What happened? They were kidnapped by the whites. And they were taken and put into these white family homes. Same thing happened in, in Israel. Uh, 
Then at the bottom of the pile, right at the bottom, you have black Jews from Ethiopia who are treated appallingly, even, even up, uh, 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 right down in the bottom. But even according to their standard, they are placed by law above the Palestinians. And right below them, you get the Palestinians. So the way it works is this, is that the Ashkenazim, which are the white Jews, the European and the American Jews, they are at the top of the ladder. Below them you've got the Sephardic Jews, who were those who were descendants of Jews, they were indigenous to that area. Below them you've got the black Jews, or the, the, the Ethiopian Jews, and then right in the bottom you've got the Palestinians. So there is a genetic class system that's in place. If you're white, you're American, you're Jewish, then you're right on top. If you're black and you're Jewish, then you are like a, a nigger, same nigger, you kept right in the bottom. So if they are talking now about supporting Jews or discrimination against the Jews, which Jews are they talking about? If they're talking about securing the interests of the Jewish people, which Jewish people are they talking about? Who? It's the white Jews. It's those Jews who come from Europe. It's those Jews who come from the United States. Those are the Jews that we are basically talking about. And they are the people who are basically controlling the mantles of power in the world today. The banking industry, the entertainment. Look at the names, Warner Brothers. Time Warner, these are Jewish, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, MGM, Jewish companies, Walt Disney, Walter Elias Disney, Jewish companies, Fox News, Jewish people involved in the Bush administration and the Barack Obama administration. In fact, Barack is a, is a Jewish name, by the way. The name is Jewish, I think it means thunder. But you have lots of people like Rahm Emanuel, basically, <laughs> who uh, are people who are behind the entire system, the entire setup, controlling powers, manipulating behind the scenes. So that's the kind of hierarchy that we have and we need to understand when we look at a position of Israel. You need to look deeper. It's not just a question of Jews are bad and this. Look at the picture. You know, you get some of these mullahs. They come, they don't know what they're talking about. They'll come and teach like we have in Durban, in Grey Street and in West Street, they come and talk nonsense many times. They tell you, all your Jews are the enemies. Uh, you must kill them. I mean, well, what kind of rubbish are you talking about? Honestly, you need to unpack the system and look at it deeper. Because them, Jews themselves are discriminated because of their race. The fact that you're Jewish doesn't mean you've got a free ticket and you are high up the ladder in Israel. You're not. You need to come from a certain racial background. So it's a colonial settler mentality. That's why all the settlers, who are the settlers? Whites. They're not black, uh, Ethiopian Jews. They are whites. Americans. Europeans. Hardline right-wing individuals. Does that answer your question? Palestine and Israel. Can you take South Africa as an uh, uh, example to uh, uh, make me understand uh, to differentiate between Palestine and Israel? Maybe like uh, Half of South Africa, maybe nine provinces are Palestine. Then uh, four provinces is, is Israel, or two names. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. One territory. It's the opposite because most of the land is Israel. Just small portion is Palestine. Palestine was the land. Palestine was the land before Israel was formed. That was the land under the Ottoman Empire, and it comprised of parts of Jordan. It comprised of parts of uh, Syria. All that was part of Palestine. Jerusalem was Palestine. All of that was Palestine. What had happened after the Balfour Declaration and after the Declaration of Independence in 1948, that land was appropriated and it was renamed and called Israel. And slowly and slowly there were expansions taking place. Parts of the West Bank, parts of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. Then you had the 1967 war, where more land was taken. You had the 73 Ramadan war, where they had a, a blow back to them. But in 1967, more land was annexed. More land was taken away. On the Battle of Line, that became part of Israel. That was taken over by Israel. So Israel is what we call the country. Palestine as a country doesn't exist per se. I mean, you have the Palestinian, you have the occupied territories which are under Israeli occupation, like the West Bank and like the Gaza. If you basically look at, at it from this particular perspective, like the entire office here, this entire room is Israel, and we've got West Bank and Gaza, that's what West Bank and Gaza is. And that will form the Palestinian state, if a state of Palestine is ever declared a separate state. So most of the land now has been taken over by, by Israel. What they've done now even more is that they've built walls 
you know the apartheid wall so the walls basically isolate one community from the next community and the more walls the walls are basically forms of annexation it annexes lands upon lands takes of so for example you have a village here a village living side by side they'll build a wall through that village so it'll separate and divide the village and they'll take over that land they'd go to another place they basically have where all the settlements are they'll basically have walls like the Berlin Wall over it so in that sense it's a form of taking over more and more and more land and what these settlers are doing is that they're settling in more and more regions there are more settlements there are more settlements being taken place more settlements being made in some of these areas in Gaza in West Bank there's more settlements being done on a daily basis so there's more appropriation being taken place so to look at the situation Gaza and West Bank which would be the only and, and parts of Jerusalem maybe the only existing Palestinian state if Palestine was ever next that would be Palestine the rest would be Israel so Israel is the majority Palestine is the it's a minority land that can be called Palestine yes yeah about a, a citizenship let me say the South Africans have emigrated to Palestine to Israel in the land yeah. of Israel then they, it happens whether it, maybe uh, uh, they get a child from uh, in that land of, of, of uh, Israel. What is the ruling concerning a citizenship in regard to people who emigrated to Israel? Yeah, look, in terms of citizenship, what happens is that most of these people who emigrate to Israel themselves are Jewish and themselves probably have families in Israel. So what happens is that they then have dual citizenship. They would have citizenship in Israel and citizenship in in South Africa, based on the fact that they've got families there. But as far as the laws of citizenship are concerned, Israel doesn't give citizenship to anyone. In fact, if I may just uh, uh, open the index here, if, if I've got something on citizenship, there's a citizenship law on page 183. This was implemented uh, in 1952, and this is what it states. If I could just read it out to you in terms of the citizenship law. Uh, where are we? 183, yeah. Look, in terms of the Israel citizenship law, um, uh, they basically state here, if I'll give you an example, uh, for the Israeli Neset, that's Israeli parliament, a Jew for the purpose of the Israeli law of return, 1950 is defined as follows, for this purpose of the law, Jew means a person who was born of a Jewish mother or has become converted to Judaism and who is not a member of another uh, religion. Uh, and further on, they basically state in terms of the mainstay citizenship law, uh, citizenship 17066, classes of citizenship, page 88 to page 89. Let me just see if, I, if this will give me a more, far more accurate uh, understanding here. 88, 89. Uh, <coughs> You see, here's how citizenship works. Citizenship is a certificate representing legal relationship between the individual and the state. Democratic citizenship is a certificate representing the recognition by the state of the right of every citizen to equal access to the political process of the state. Now, here it says here, in the state of Israel, the right of a citizen classified in law as a non-Jew to partake in the political process is formally equal to the right of a citizen classified in law as a Jew in principle. Likewise, the standing of a citizen classified in law as a non-Jew before the courts of law is in principle equal to the standing of a citizen classified in law as a Jew, although in practice it's different. In system, Israeli legal system is based fundamentally on the determination of at least two classes of citizenship. Class A, citizenship for such citizens as are classified in law as Jews, and as such are allocated in law a privileged access to the material resources of the state and the social as well as the welfare services of the state only because they are classified in law as Jew, versus class B citizenship for such citizens as are classified in law as non-Jews, like the Israeli Arabs. You see, they're not Palestinians, but they're Arabs who have lived in Israel and they've attained Israeli citizenship. They become Israeli Arabs namely Arabs and as such are discriminated in law with regards to their rights to equal access to the material resources of the state as well as the social uh, and welfare service of the state. So citizenship is quite limited. If you're a Jew, by definition, anywhere in the world, 
you can get immediate access to the state of Israel. You can get automatic citizenship to the state of Israel to qualify as a citizen. If you're an Arab in that country, then it'll be more difficult. You're not necessarily entitled to citizenship. They can keep you in a band. So you basically got what? You've got refugee status. Mm. Even though you live in Israel, <clears throat> they keep you under refugee status and they keep you perpetually under their curtailing uh, straitjacket. If you've got Israeli citizenship, which means you become an Israeli Arab, even that doesn't help you out because then you're classified under the B citizenship, which is granted by Israel, which means you'd be discriminated against in getting certain uh, access to certain social welfare, access to certain rights, access to certain um, uh, amenities and, and, and development. So, so, so there's different classes. That's why today, wrongfully so, it's against the law, Many Jews in South Africa go to Israel and they fight. They go and they participate in the kibbutz. Can you see? They, they, they are part and parcel of the system. They can get an automatic Israeli citizenship without even having families staying there. In the case of non-Jew, uh, it will be far more difficult. Anywhere in the world, if you're Jewish, you want to go to Israel, you can attain citizenship. to ask about the Rothschild family. Yeah. What significant, significant role did it play on the establishment of the Israeli settlement? Well, that's what I told you earlier on. Um, the Rothschild banking family, Lord Lionel Walter Rothschild, uh, in fact, he was one of the individuals that was behind the World Zionist Congress. Most of the Rothschild banking dynasty, the family itself, were part and parcel of the Congress. And so the letter that was given by Arthur Balfour to Lord Rothschild was a declaration to Rothschild as a leader of the Jewish Zionists that your aspirations are basically going to be fulfilled and met in terms of Britain acceding to your requests and allowing you to declare a state of your own. So the Rothschild banking family were instrumental in, in many respects in terms, of, uh, uh, form, in terms of the formation of the state of Israel. Uh, as far as funding is concerned, they, 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 they formed a lot of uh, backing pertaining to the funding. Um, talk was that they even funded Hitler in the Second World War. Uh, you know, I spoke about this collusion that existed between the leading Zionists and the, uh, the, the Nazis in terms of uh, having or creating the safe passage for them to go to Israel in exchange for the killing of uh, the Jewish people. So they had quite a significant role to play, in fact, because they were leading bankers at that particular time in Germany, and certainly they were part and parcel of the elite uh, Jewish dynasties that existed at that point in time. They were Zionists, ultra-Zionists, and they were a highly powerful family. And certainly the letter from Balfour was to, uh, what's his name, to Rothschild, Lord Rothschild. The British Rothschild, because the Rothschild family, you had the British family and you had the German family, <coughs> all related. Since the United Nations has been helping uh, these countries uh, uh, or fighting against these countries that are, are racist uh, 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 countries, like, where, like let's say here in South Africa, wherever you find that the blacks are oppressed by, uh, by the white, uh, the United Nations is trying hard to make sure that there is equality within the state. But now back to what is happening in Israel and Palestine. What is the role of United Nations? No, they've passed resolutions. They've passed resolutions upon resolutions in respect of the Israeli state. I mean, for the past, how many hundreds of resolutions they've passed declaring uh, crimes against humanity, but no action has been taken. I mean, Ban Ki-moon, who is the present Secretary General of the United Nations, in Gaza, when you looked at the uh, problems, and we'll go into Gaza, but uh, later on when we come back, uh, he called for an inquiry. And we had the special rapporteur to Israel, I think it was Richard Falk, who had been appointed to, to do a report, and there was a report that was subsequently done. But when the report was done, uh, Ban Ki-moon made an about turn and said, look, um, the report is of no consequence. We think the report is fair, but he took no further action against Israel. So. Nothing particularly, because what happens is that if you look at the Security Council, there are two permanent members. There's a, there's a non-permanent members and there's a permanent members of the Security Council. You know who the permanent members of the Security Council are. There's Britain, there's France, there's the United States, there's uh, Russia, Britain, France, US, Russia and China. Five permanent members of the, non of the UN Security Council. Now, to vote, 
you need you need vetoing powers. I mean, if one vetoes the other, for example, where for example it was declared that Israel is an apartheid state, the U.S. refused to vote. U.S. and Britain. So each time they basically go to the table, you've got U.S. and Britain that will be vetoing any uh, a vote uh, that will be gone or resolution that would be adopted or people would abstain from voting. So because you've got these members on the permanent council, on the UN Security Council, it becomes difficult to do anything. The United States is a primary backer of the State of Israel. It gives something like $3 billion annually to the State of Israel for sustenance. And certainly Britain itself is also a supporter of the State of Israel. So you've got these two permanent countries on the UN Security Council as permanent members that would object to any action, drastic action being taken against them. According to the explanation yeah. in what the Prime Minister of Israel said, what, is, what was the preferred concept and why that, why you prefer that concept? What, what concept? Uh, to differentiate the, the Jewish people than... Uh, I don't understand. What he says, who, which Prime Minister are you referring to? The, the, the Prime Minister of Israel. No, he's not the present Prime Minister of Israel. This guy, David Ben-Gurion, was the first Prime Minister of Israel. Yes, the yes. first one. Yes. And what he says? About what? About the differentiate these Israel people than other. That you say that he prefer this concept than the people of Jews, the Jewish people than others. Yeah, I, I don't know, someone probably just unpacked it. What, what, are you, what are you saying? Are you saying what prefer Israel to who? Preferring Israel to prefer the Jewish state to Jewish nation, to the Jewish individual. Yeah. I think the question is, he wants to know why is it that the, the Jewish elite preferred the state of Israel yes. to, the, to the Jewish people? Well, it's because Jewish people were cannon fodder. They could be used. They were of no consequence. They were peasants. The Jewish people were peasants, by and large, many of them were, were poor, from poor backgrounds. So, in exchange for land, uh, these Jewish peasants were of no consequence. Land, to acquire land, would be a massive gain, because that land there would have wealth, it would be a major basin in the Middle Eastern region, it would have the propensity for forthcoming developments and ventures, it would also have the potential of one day perhaps taking over the Middle East. So why do you make do with that? That land, that was the main key. The Jewish state, establishing the state was the main key. And many of the other Jews that were killed were non-Zionist Jews. So it never filled the ideology. It never filled the ideology of him. It never filled the ideology of the Jewish elite. It never sustained that ideology. And so as a result of that, it was not really necessary to sustain them. Where they could, they of course transferred them. But most of the guys who transferred to Israel were by and large Zionist Jews who supported the idea. There were of course a sprinkling of Jews who were non-Zionist who came and settled there, but by and large they were Zionist. There was a, a collusion between Nazi Germany and these so-called Zionists, but their main aim was to establish the state of Israel. If they could get a country of their own, it would mean that they would basically acquire a large amount of power. And so that was the basic brainchild behind the establishment. Why, uh... Uh, Palestine in, uh, in particular, and not another country that the, uh, the, the, uh, the Zionists had actually suggested to, uh, to settle in, because I, I heard some stories about they were, they were granted that they could go to Madagascar, and South America, and the, yeah, South America, and the Uganda as well, and they turned down all those countries, so well, Israel in particular. You see, here what they could get is, over and above getting a land, they say that they were promised that land, or 2,000 years ago they had that land. So basically it would go back to their roots, it would gain some kind of religious legitimacy which would be, which would be otherwise lacking. So for example, ultra-Orthodox religious Jews themselves would support the idea of a state for Jewish people. It's what they call it. It goes back to their consciousness, it goes back to their psyche, that they were at one point in time in history promised the land of milk and honey. They were promised a Jewish land. Uh, having settled in Madagascar, Uganda would not have had the same effect. Having settled in Israel, it would take them back to their roots, what they claim would be their roots, although they never had roots, because these were not even descendants of those people, although they claimed that, look, they have a historical connection. They were not even descendants. Their descendants, they were descendants of Sumerians, of people who came from the Khazar region, the Ashkenazi Jews, they were European Jews. They had no physical descent in that particular region. But they, 
gained or they, they kind of perpetuated this this uh, claim to Israel based on their on the on the historical question and based on the fact that at one point in time Israel was theirs or what they claimed to be theirs during the time of Jesus in Jerusalem. Even then it was under Roman occupation. But at one point in time, historically speaking, Israel uh, was what they could call the land of the Jews. So that effect of moving to Israel would fulfill what they asked for, what they wanted for Israel, because they were expelled. Even though they lived there, they were subsequently, they, they basically left on their own and they moved and they had different communities uh, from one part or the other. So as a fulfillment of that promise, which they claimed that God promised Moses, they would sought to gain legitimacy also from other religiously minded Jews in settling in Israel. That's the only issue that could be. So settling in Madagascar and settling in Uganda wouldn't have served their purpose because it wouldn't have had the same impact as settling in Israel would. That's the, the particular reason and rationale for that. But basically, uh, the sole aim and objective is to inform minds, to create that level of discourse, to show us that, look, you know, um, get the truth out there. Get the reality. Get the reality of the truth out there. Someone said, I think it was Gandhi who said, that if, even if you are in a minority of one, then the truth is still the truth. Even if you are in a minority of one. George Orwell, he wrote a book called 1984. Uh, he wrote a book called 1984. <coughs> In the year 1948, that was after the post-Weimar Republic in, uh, uh, sorry, when the, I believe the Weimar Republic was subsequently formed. And in that, there was a poignant remark and comment that he made. And he said that in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. In times of monumental deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And we are living now in a time of insurmountable deceit. You look at it around you, you look at your political leaders, they failed you. You look at your religious leaders, they failed you. You look at the economic system, it's been totally failed. It's, a, it's like we were discussing earlier, um, uh, just it's effectively an appropriation of the free market system for that selective elite, for that manipulated uh, group of individuals who are controlling the mantles of power through means such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and so on. And it's those people that you as future leaders of tomorrow need to basically tackle and deal with. But you cannot without the necessary knowledge. So if, for example, we get caught up with the information, in the information that we get, which is highly censored or highly selective or highly skewed in accordance with an established teaching tradition, then it becomes problematic. But if, of course, we are broad enough to accept different and diverse points of view, even though they might not be acceptable to us, or they might be viewed as taboo in certain aspects of our society, like in Muslim community, so many issues you can't discuss openly and freely in mosques in, uh, in South Africa because they'll clamp down on you. But if we are open to see these various ideas, because then it gives us the indication that, look, we are brave enough and we are secure in our faith. We are not insecure. Because it's only an insecure mind that is not open up to new ideas and different points of view. A secure mind doesn't mean debating, changing. That's why even something like Iman or faith. Um, Imam Ghazali said that um, you know, he, who has not he who has not doubted has not believed. In other words, doubt is a foundational basis for belief. If you haven't doubted, if you haven't reflected, if you haven't thought then how can you truly be said to believe? Because your iman fluctuates from point to point. Same with thoughts, same with revolutionary thinking processes and so on. So it's good to see that if we are open to different ideas and we internalize them and we accept them, of course, propound new ideas, new theories, and in that way, you can make meaningful change to societies around us. Now, when we stopped on the last time, we gave a brief history in terms of Zionism right from the time of its inception, uh, beginning with Theodor Herzl, right through the Balfour Declaration in 1917, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the subsequent declaration in 1948, and its subsequent creation. Now, many of you, I think, were curious to know, I would assume, some of the organizations in the world today that purport to promulgate principles which are right-wing, which are Zionist, and which are, in a sense, pro-Israeli. Now, I think it's important to make the distinction because most of us do not, that you, cannot, you do not necessarily have to be Jewish to be a Zionist. 
And contrary-wise, not every Zionist is a religiously practicing Jew. The very foundation of Zionism was what? Who was a founder? Was he a practicing religious Jew? No, he was not. He was an atheist. He had it. He was secular-minded. It's a colonial construct. And you look at some of these particular organizations. This is an organization, as you see, is called the Anti-Defamation League. Now, that's an oxymoron, because defamation... It's purporting to now state that anyone who defames any person, they will be liable to be prosecuted. Uh, it's a United-based organization. They describe itself as an NGO. Some would say it's an arm, an extension of the State of Israel. Describing itself as a nation's premier civil rights human relations agency, the ADL states that it fights anti-Semitism and all forms of bigotry, defends democratic ideals, and protects civil rights for all. But who is this all? There are people like Richard Warman, for example, in Canada, who would, who would go out of his way, to, he's a perpetual litigant, he'll go out of his way to prosecute you or to, uh, to, to institute an action against you for defamation if you say anything that is remotely critical of the state of Israel. And that's a magic wand. You, you, you place that magic wand of anti-Semitism and it creates a silence. That's why in Hollywood, or in the entertainment industry, or even in the news medium, there's such a, a kind of a, if I may put it in this way, such a, a not just an acquiescence, but such a, um, a soft approach, a soft line. Um, the fact that people are not open to air their views and opinions. Why is it that since the late 50s, right up until now, you can basically deal with anything in the context of Hollywood. You can deal with, you can, you can... Uh, basically demonize the Vietnamese, you can demonize the Asians, you can demonize the Japanese and the Chinese like they did after the Second World War, like they did against the Vietnamese in the 60s in movies like Rambo, in movies like Platoon, uh, sometimes aggressive varieties. You can demonize Arabs, it's totally acceptable to demonize them, movies like The Siege, Delta Force, Executive Decision, but somehow or the other it's always problematic to demonize the Israelis, or for example, even satire. You satirize anything that is remotely related to the state of Israel, you'll be clamped down upon. You'll be labeled as an anti-Semite. You'll be labeled as a racist. It's because the system not just perpetuates that particular maintenance of the status quo, but many within the system are themselves also ideologues. That's why you look at the entertainment industry, Warner Brothers or Walt Disney or um, Fox News or MSNBC or CBS or PBC or ABC, all these networks by the same system with the same idea and perpetuating the same bias and prejudice. That's why you find remarkable journalists like John Pulger or Robert Fisk, their works and their documentaries are never shown in, in, in the United States. Strangely enough, a country which purports to speak for freedom of expression and freedom of speech has selective censorship when it comes to certain particular issues. So the Anti-Defamation League is one amongst the many in terms of the stream of organizations that deals with a basically um, like, a, like a watch, like a watch, basically checking society, monitoring society, seeing if there's anything that is remotely critical and they'll clamp down. And they've got people in every aspect of their media, in, in the, you know, they, I, was, I was speaking to someone if you look at the equivalent in South Africa, um, I did an article in the Daily News, I think just in the Gaza crisis, and immediately thereafter, we had uh, this guy, David Sachs, just a week thereafter, David Sachs from the Jewish Board of Deputies doing a massive reply on an entire page in the Daily News. Now, the point is, they've got eyes and ears everywhere. You've got websites, you've got housewives, Zionists of, of housewives of people who are Zionist ideologues sitting at home and simply monitoring society to see any developments in terms of critique, in terms of anything that is critical. Because the main aim is to always maintain the myth and maintain the fiction that Israel can never do anything which is wrong and Israel is always right. That's why you have this so much of emphasis, even in recent years, on the Holocaust. Why was there never any discussion on the Indonesian Holocaust, the genocide that took place under General Suharto? Why is there never a discussion on the Armenian Holocaust in the 1918, the First World War? Why only on the Jewish Holocaust? It's because if you can create in the consciousness and the minds of people this idea of this massacre, of this genocide, then it keeps up and it perpetuates a fiction that that is a necessity for the State of Israel to exist. 
That's a justification for the state of Israel to exist. Even though historical tradition shows us that many of the Zionists in fact had direct collusion, active collusion with the Nazi party. Like people like uh, the other guy we're discussing, can't pick up his name now. Or even uh, uh, Rothschild himself, uh, Walter Rothschild, when Lord Balfour wrote the letter to him at that particular point in history. Active collusion with the Nazis to the detriment of the Jewish people or the masses. Um, the ADL, just a brief background, in 1913, formed by the Benai Brith in the United States, its original mission statement was to stop by appeals, reason and conscience, and if necessary, by appeals to law, the defamation of Jewish people. So it called itself the Anti-Defamation League, but it's selective. Its ultimate purpose is to secure justice and fair treatment to all citizens alike, in principle, and to put an end forever to unjust and unfair discrimination against and ridicule of any sect or body of citizens. Again, in principle, because we have had very few cases where it's taken up the causes of minorities. The ADL has 29 offices in the United States and three offices in other countries with the headquarters again in New York uh, City. A large number of ideologues based there. And Abraham Foxman himself, an art Zionist Foxman, the national director in the United States, the national chairman is Glenn Levi or Levi. Can you see the background? Then you've got another organization here <coughs> called APAC. Anyone knows what it stands for? It's the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee. It's an American lobbying group, powerful lobbying group. In fact, I believe in the late 80s. Uh, you guys 